Leads, leads, leads. What is happening? Welcome to Working Hours, an oral history podcast about a place called Leeds, a time called now, and an activity called work. Working Hours wants to record 1,000 loiners over the course of this, the most important decade in the history of the human species, and ask them about what they do all day and hear how they feel about it. My name is Simon, and this is all my fault. My mission here is to try to map out what my city, Leeds, a city that has declared a climate emergency, did during humanity's biggest emergency. On working hours, we hear how loiners have, are, and will be coping with our multiple and expanding crises during their day-to-day working hours. Can we turn things around? We'll find out. To tell this story, I need loiners. Loiners like you, dear listener. I need people in Leeds or people from Leeds to come on this podcast and just tell me what they do all day and let me record how this affects us. Thank you for listening. What did you want to be when you grew up? When I was about seven, I wanted to be a marine biologist. I was obsessed with fish. (laughs) I had loads of books about fish, but then realised that I was rubbish at science. So that wasn't something that I I ended up doing. Um, And as I grew up I was I was a writer and I love stories and I kind of naturally fell into um kind of the media basically I wanted to, I lived just outside London mm-hmm. and I wanted to go and work in the media doing kind of writing creative journalism um so that's kind of where I kind of headed towards away from being a marine biologist and kind of into more creative arts yeah, I mean, it's um, you couldn't get more different, could you? you totally landlubbery activity compared to your marine biology. Was that um, what, what? What was the inspiration for that? Because my immediate thought would be Jaws, but then maybe it's somewhere between Jaws and Finding Nemo. <laughs> yeah, I don't know really where it came from. I just, I think I wanted to live under the ocean. I think I wanted to, maybe I'd, I probably watched like Little Mermaid yeah. when I was young, yeah. um, and thought that living, you know, under the sea would be really cool. Mm-hmm. So then I did loads of research on different animals, and I still, to be fair, I am still quite interested in kind of like ocean creatures. Mm-hmm. Like I'm obsessed with them, um, like a giant squid and colossal mm-hmm. squid. The fact they kind of live under the ocean, never really seen them. So I kind of quite not that I'd want to go anywhere near. A giant the deep quiz. ocean. <laughs> yeah, I just like to look, to hear about it, watch TikTok videos of it. <laughs> Do you scuba? No, I've never. No, I've never scuba. I have like, I have snorkeled. Like, you know, mm. I've been to like Bali. I've been to quite a nice place and snorkeled and things. But no, I've never took it any further. Really, of, of scuba diving. Maybe I should. Maybe that would be like one of my ambitions for the future. Mm, it's good fun. Yeah. Um, yeah, I did a dive master while I was away, <laughs> and um, yeah, we did like a, a thirty meter deep dive. And the, the dive instructor did this game with us before we went down. Uh, so he's like, I'm going to hold up my hand. And I, however many fingers I've got, you hold up your hand so, so that it makes up to nine. And he's like, right, we'll do this on the boat. So he said, like, we'll do this when we get down there to show you the difference. Like, because you're down at 30 meters, you've got loads of nitrogen oxide, like nitrous oxide in your blood from the pressure. And it slows your brain down and makes you giddy. And he was like, so he's doing this underwater. So it took a few minutes or seconds to actually realize like, what's he doing. And then you, you're trying to work it out and you, you, your brain is acting so much slower. Like it's noticeable. So you just sort of get really? giggling underwater. It's a <laughs> weird experience, but yeah, it was cool. Um, that is cool. Yeah, it's cool. I'd like to do that. Yeah. Though it slightly scares me because the idea of, of sharks and things, but yeah. It's, it's nerve wracking. Like diving, and you have to be in comfortable conditions, and yeah, but it's it's good fun, yeah. Yeah. You're listening to Series Five, Episode Fifteen, and to my guest Vicky Rogerson. This is another Squadcast interview recorded on the twenty first of May, twenty twenty four. Hello, Vicky Rogerson is a seasoned PR communication specialist with more than twenty years of senior level comms experience working within some of the UK's biggest food and drink brands. She has been on both sides of the fence by working in a range of industry-leading PR and advertising agencies, as well as seven years as head of food and BWS PR in-house for Asda. She founded North PR in 2018 as she saw a food and drink skills gap in the PR industry, which was just letting brands down. 
They were paying for fancy communications campaigns that just didn't deliver from PR professionals who didn't understand the sector. Vicky is on a mission to celebrate great food and drink stories from exciting brands that are making a real difference in the buzzing food sector. Vicky is adept at creating and delivering bespoke, thoughtful and impactful profile raising campaigns that turn heads. Vicky's portfolio boasts leading light in the food and drink arena such as Asda, Pizza Express, Slow Motion Distillery, Holland's Pies, Vio Life, Butterkist, Farmerton and Company, Pork Farms and R&R Ice Cream. Let's do this. Episode 125 of Working Hours with Vicky Rogerson. So um, back to the what we're actually talking about. Uh, <laughs> so, so what is it that you're doing now then? So now I run North PR, which is a food and drink PR agency, which would get further away from being anything to do with fish, really. Um, so yeah, so I set North PR up about seven years, seven years ago. So I'm originally a Londoner. So I'm originally, I was born in London, but I was raised in North Kent. Mm. But I've lived in Leeds longer than I was ever down south. So I've lived in Leeds for 25 years, I think now. Mm. So, but yeah, so North, North PR, we specialise in food and drink brands, both from, from Yorkshire, but also across the country. So we do PR comms work for like food, tell food stories basically is how I kind of describe it. Lots of lovely stories about lovely food. And it gets, and it helps me to indulge in my passion for visiting kind of farm shops and supermarkets and farmers markets and just anywhere where I can go and have a look at different food products and try them and hear their stories and visit farms and things, which I just love. Mm. So, yeah. so how did you get into it? It's kind of a long convoluted story really. I when I was when I was younger, I moved well, I moved to work in London when I was 18. So I was lived just outside London in Kent and I wanted to get a job in the in the media in the 90s. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I think mainly because I wanted to go to all the parties. I think that was my main reason. <laughs> um my, I don't tell my dad that though, because he was like, Oh yes, gonna go work in a newspaper and be official, but I was like, <laughs> I'm gonna go before the parties um so I started working in um kind of publishing and events so I did writing and journalism and then I fell into a PR job which I was in a really cool agency and basically I did go to lots of parties which mm. was brilliant in the 90s which was you know as you can imagine just like in London the 90s was a bit was a bit chaotic really um and I did I did PR I didn't really enjoy it that much but I did do quite a lot of work with um food and drink brands because lots of food and drink brands get PR so I worked like Meat and Livestock Commission and Tesco and various other brands which mm. was which was really cool and then I kind of ended up working in the Daily Express doing kind of more journalism and kind of production for a while and I just I kind of really I kind of loved the PR a bit but I didn't feel like I did it as well as I could have done I was quite young so I left home when I was 18 so I was working when I was 18 mm. Um, and you know, tried as you do when you're young, you try lots of different jobs and lots of different experiences, see kind of what you finally settle on. Mm. Um, and then I moved up to Leeds when I was 22 to do my degree. So I went to University of Leeds, do sociology, which I, which was amazing. I had mm. an absolute ball, as you can imagine. Um, really loved studying, and I really loved the environment in Leeds. And then after when I graduated, I was. Um, what do I do now? Like, do I what? What should I do? What job should I do? I mean, sociology, you know, is really interesting, and it's definitely helped kind of my career longer term, understanding people and society mm. and how they kind of interact together. But it's not great to get a job. Yeah, so there's not people queuing up to get sociology jobs and yeah, yeah all those sociology jobs, you know, that you can get. And I didn't want to be a social worker, or you know, I didn't want to kind of do, mm. do that really. So I was like, well, I'll give PR a go. Like I've always worked. Like I'll see kind of you know what PR is like again. I'll give it a second go. Mm. Um, and I got a job working in an agency in Leeds for Poulters. Mm. It doesn't exist anymore. And and then just absolutely loved it. And then so I've worked in in PR now for yeah 25 years 20 mm. 25 years it maybe it's feel very old um and that kind of journey I guess kind of led me to set my own agency up so I've always worked in food and drink brands I've always loved food and drink my dad's a big foodie mm. we make bread and it was food was a real central part of our kind of family growing up and mm. I've always just really been in, just interested in it I guess um and then through the PR agencies that I work for and the brands that we that I did. I ended up working um, as head of food PR at Asda for eight years, mm. which was 
kind of like mind blowing in lots of ways because I've worked during the Walmart years. So it was just our, yeah. So it was yeah. So they bought it was kind of like five or six years after they'd after the Walmart. So yeah. kind of it was before the Iser Brothers bought it. So yeah. it was probably it was about I left about seven years ago, I think. So yes, yeah, so I went. I'd kind of when you work in PR, you work in PR agencies. It can the kind of the career path can seem quite kind of hard because it's so you get to like a certain level, account director, senior account director. Mm. And then where do you go after that? You know, yeah. Unless you run your own agency, it's, it's quite hard to see the kind of career path. But then I went into Asda and this whole career path opened up. It was amazing. Suddenly I was working, you know, in a in an, you know, the big one of the biggest supermarkets in the UK of all of these products. And I was responsible for 80 percent of the, the products that we sold in a supermarket. So I used to go visit farms and go meet producers, go to factories, you know, do big press events. It was just so amazing to learn so much more about the food and drink industry. It just really instilled this kind of passion. It just sparked this real passion for me Mm -hmm. that was there before, but just accelerated it. Um, I just absolutely absolutely loved everything to do with food food and drink and even the challenges, because at a time when I was at Asda, Obviously, working in PR, you have to deal with crisis issues as well. Mm. So I was there when horse meat scandal hit. Mm. Um, so that was like very kind of difficult, stressful, but quite interesting actually to look at, you know, why it happened and kind of the supply mm. chain and kind of you know looking at different ways of how we produce our food. Um, I was like dealt with issues like food labelling and you know recalls and just general challenges in food which is just again really interesting having to deal with those crisis and issues which mm. has stood me in pretty good stead in the future now the work that I do um and yeah it's just kind of I just fell into kind of food and I after I left Asda I worked in another agency that was kind of you know more senior I wanted to just I just wanted to focus on food I got I got to 40 and I was like I just want to do food and drink that's all I want to do I'm just so passionate about it um, and I'd also kind of previously about 12 years, 13 years ago, I set up with a kind of guy who I met on Twitter, <laughs> um, a cheese club called Homage de Fromage. Oh, yeah, yeah. So, yeah. So we set that up, me and Nick, who I met on Twitter, because we were randomly talking about cheese on Twitter. <laughs> As like, you do. <laughs> back in the day when Twitter wasn't such a hostile place, <laughs> it could just be, you know, really creative. And it was a time when the clandestine cake club had been set up in Leeds, there was like, there was quite a lot of like underground supper clubs and stuff mm. going on. We were like, God, let's just, let's just do something with cheese. Like, what could that be? Mm. And then um, I met Nick in a, in a coffee shop and we kind of asked lots of other people to come as well. And it was just me and Nick. <laughs> so what we could do is like, we could like just buy a lump of cheddar and put it in between the table and just talk about it. And um, we didn't really know what to do. So we just, just decided to go just randomly. Oh, well, found a venue and just kind of did a cheddar theme Mm -hmm. and it was when I was working at Asda as well and we got like six cheddars that I'd bought from Leeds Market Mm -hmm. or Asda or whatever and um, luckily at the time I was doing the PR for Alex James who was in Blur who was launching his cheese at Asda Mm -hmm. so he came to our first ever homage from ours oh nice like we peaked we peaked really early on our first one we've never gone back to where it was before um and he came and did like sexual things with cheese in this event which was just like you know just pouring like mozzarella cheese thing onto baked potatoes and like honey and stuff like it was just all very sexual um and yeah and then so yeah so then that launched kind of homage from Marge and 13 years later we're still running events so I've had kind of food as well mm. you know I do joint lots of things with food and homage from Marge is one of those things that I just do I mean literally for pure pleasure we had a restaurant and stuff mm. as well a cheese restaurant for a while and um, so that kind of all those things together kind of led me to set up North PR which is just basically a passion project for me because I just get to love I just get to enjoy great food and meet great people who make great food and drink mm. and just tell their stories and just do cool stuff and that was yeah seven years ago and I absolutely love it it's like it is personal passion so have you uh, I mean in in kind of modern or social media kind of rhetoric parlance I mean you've really niched down there I mean not not like you've gone so specific that we only do PR for one particular type of cheddar but like food is quite specific i mean there can't be many specifically food oriented 
PR companies. I would assume maybe there's loads. Yeah, well, in London, there are quite a lot of like food and drink, specific food and drink agencies. A lot of them tend to focus on restaurants. Mm. There's a lot of big restaurants in London. Um, and they do, and there are some around, there are some dotted around, but there wasn't a specific food and drink PR agency in the North. Mm. So there was kind of one in Oldham that kind of did, did does do some food, but there wasn't really anyone doing kind of what I wanted to do, which mm. was, you know, very specifically around food. And everyone said to me, you're mad to go so niche, you know, most PR agencies you know, do lots of specialisms and they broaden out kind of what they do and they might have a bit of food. Um, but I just never, I was never satisfied with that because I always thought that clients didn't get the full expertise because they were just, you're just a comms expert, but you're not, you don't really understand food and retail and challenges being faced. Yeah, the, you don't understand the product necessarily, the market. I mean, it's like that thing with, you know, early IT where they'd come in and they'd like go, all oh, right, what do you do here? And they try and understand it. And you couldn't because you can't understand a culture, a sector, like just from a few discussions. You know, he says doing this. Um, <laughs> yeah, it's, it's difficult. So having that knowledge and understanding that experience that you can draw on and make it specialised, that's really useful, I think. Yeah, absolutely. And it's kind of, it's like understanding the trends and kind of what people are eating and how they're eating and the challenges as well. You know, I can, I have a good kind of expertise now. I can you know, speak to a client and say whether or not I think actually is there, is the product they've produced actually is that interesting? Is it on trend? Is it relevant? You know, and give advice and guidance around how they can promote their product. Whereas if you didn't have that expertise, then you would just take their product at face value, you know, and kind of just try to PR it. And actually, mm. you wouldn't be really sure if it would succeed or not, or that you could have the right strategy. So I think having a, a good expertise in the industry is is helpful. And also, because I've got that expertise of working at Asda, I understand very much the retail environment and the challenges, the massive challenges of trying to get, you know, make a product or a brand successful because, you know, there's a lot of... You know, it's a bit of a whimsical kind of thing, isn't it? A lot of people, they work in, why they was working IT or finance or something, and then, you know, they get to their kind of mid-30s, 40s, and they're going to go, actually, I really, I've always dreamt about, you know, launching my own beer or, you know, mm. creating my own restaurant or whatever that might be. And um, and actually, there's a bit, like, always, I've seen all these stories about these entrepreneurs who, you know, they they create a new nut butter and then they launch it and it goes into, you know, thousands of Tesco stores and loads of Sainsbury's and they become millionaires overnight, you know, they're like overnight successes. And kind of people think that's how it works. And, mm. you know, it isn't actually. It's really it's a really hard slog to be able to launch food products. And mm. you kind of need those people around you to be to give you that reality of actually how does that, you know, how are you going to launch it and how, you know, the kind of the path that, you go on to then build those brands. And yes, it is possible to create, you know, amazing brands that do brilliantly, but there are challenges. So it's I think it's having the expertise and understanding of all of those challenges as well, as well as the opportunities, mm-hmm. um, is helpful. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, your example of getting things into supermarkets, like that made me think. So I had a friend that was um, working at a large sweet company, Haribo. Um <laughs> And I remember them, like this was years back, but sort of having conversations about the various supermarkets. It's like we're in this supermarket, but we're trying to get into this supermarket. And that's a, you know, that's not just some guy who's come up with a butter. That's like, you know, it's a whole process and it takes time. And you've got to, you know, obviously they're buying at scale and the price has to be negotiated and like how long they're going to buy it for and all of this kind of stuff. So. Yeah. Yeah. If yeah. you are, if you are a kind of, you know, we, we work with up and coming producers that are kind of launched, but also work with big brands. But you know, if you are an up and coming producer, even if you've been around for a long time, you're competing against you're competing against the Haribos. Mm. You know, how are you going to get listed above and beyond? You know, someone like that's a massive manufacturer, yeah, or Unilever, or, yeah. or Unilever, and they, you know, it is sometimes 
And I would clearly say to clients, you know, the supermarkets aren't the be on end all, actually. There are amazing opportunities to sell online. You know, that's huge recently, obviously, after COVID, um, creating an online e-commerce business, selling into farm shops and independents. There's so many other routes to market, actually. You don't, it's not all about going into supermarkets. It's kind of seeing the kind of breadth, really, of the opportunity. Mm. I guess some products as well, you would advise them maybe at points. So I'm thinking, like, for some brands, you don't want them in supermarkets because that's kind of part of the brand identity. It's like, this is more artisan. It's more, spe- you know, like this is rare and more luxury. Exactly. It's like the, I think it's a Tyrrell's example. I think it's Tyrrell's. Um, years ago, refused to, when they launched their first crisp range, kind of premium crisp, they refused to go into Tesco. Mm. And they made a story about not wanting their product in Tesco. They didn't want it to be this kind of mainstream brand. And, and actually that kind of did them a lot of favours in the future because it helped build their, you know, their reputation mm. of that being kind of artisan and provenance based and quality driven and you know, not wanting to go into a supermarket. Obviously they are in supermarket now, they've sold the business. But um, but it's quite, yeah, it's kind of interesting, isn't it? Like you don't, it's not the be on end all, but there are other routes of ways of getting your products out there if that's mm. what you want. I mean, like, I don't know if I want to scratch like... I can't think of the right metaphor. You can jump in, you're the PR person. Um, but like, I don't know if I want to open the can of worms, I guess, of food in class, because that's a whole area of like, cause that's got to be something that you've got to be really kind of aware of when you've got a food and a product and how that food is being commodified and, and who it's being marketed at. So that's a whole thing i mean i guess there's yeah, a way in which like there's a food pyramid of like these are posh foods these are not posh foods these are medium posh foods <laughs> there is and there's a real kind of you know we live in a, in a very class structured retail system if you think you know different supermarkets whether you're a waitress shopper or you're an house shopper um and then products and food fits into that and um, and I guess for me working in Asda, you know, it was always about good food should be for all people, mm. which isn't necessarily, and it should be about offering value, not just about, you know, just having some food that is so premium that it's inaccessible. You know, everyone should be able to enjoy good food. Mm. And and it's kind of how you then position some of those kind of products because, yeah, there are, there are some, you know, actually even not even that, I think it's like, you know, Wagyu beef, for example, mm. You know, at the time that that was like for very, very rich people who could afford it, you know, but actually, you know, I also sold Wagyu and, you know, so you can, there are, it's kind of levels and differences around, but it is, we are quite class structured and kind of how we eat. And we need to be really conscious of all the things that are happening in, you know, the macro environment around health and financial stability and cost of living crisis and the environment, all those things, you know, ultimately impact on quality and perception and value of food. Mm. So we need to have all of those things in place to make sure that what we're trying to deliver is delivering the right for everyone Mm. on the planet. And it's also protecting the planet too. Okay, so I'm going to jump into the other questions. Um, So I wanted to start, I was thinking of moving them around a bit and maybe starting with the other questions, but I think I'm going to go with COVID first. We'll go through that and then we'll move into probably social media next. So I'm looking at two main things. So your experience going into the lockdown, like did your work increase massively? Did it drop off a cliff or did it stay about the same? Um, and then coming out the other side, what has changed for you sort of permanently? Like has the... <laughs> I'm going to stop asking has there been because for everyone it, it has made permanent changes but like what have the changes been has it just been you know being online more and meeting online like have there been other changes yeah, so I guess going into Covid I had set up the business because two and a half years or so before so I set up in 2018 17, 18, I think so I'd kind of the business was starting to to grow over that time it was kind of just me with some couple of freelancers here mm. and there I was working I had a desk in um a PR agency, BT, um, it was now called Tiger Bond. So I was working kind of a couple of days in an office and kind of, you know, loving life, you know, a lot of clients and leads. And it was, you know, it was a great, I was having a great time. I was really pleased the business was, was kind of, you know, was taking off. Mm. And then COVID hit and, yeah, it wiped out 40% of my business overnight. Mm. And luckily, in some ways, I had moved away from hospitality PR. I like 
my skill area or our skill area is very much on FMCG products because I just love it. I like you know things that could be sold in supermarkets mm-hmm. effectively. So I'd I'd moved the business away from hospitality because it was so challenging. And actually that was, you know, in hindsight was a good place to be. So I didn't have this massive amount of restaurants or mm. pubs or bars that then, you know, obviously those businesses, you know, were really, really challenged over that time. Um, so, yeah, we, I lost about 40%. And I was always working from home, you know, a bit at home and, and, you know, in office anyway. So I was kind of set up to just be at home. But it was it was challenging because I lost a lot of business. I was a limited company, so I didn't get any, you know, government support. Um, I had two kids, quite young kids at home. So that was, you know, I was <laughs> very challenging time. So from from the business point of view, initially, yes, it was really scary, actually. And I think the worst thing for me was I was so kind of busy kind of running around doing stuff and then suddenly kind of to stop um, and be at home was, I think for everyone, it was just kind of quite a shocking kind mm. of thing. Um, but I worked all the way through it. I used to get up at four in the morning and I would work for like five or six hours while the kids were kind of just getting up and getting ready. And I'd take them out for a walk, you know, for our kind of sanctioned walk at lunchtime and then, you know, come back and work in the evening. So I kind of worked around it and I worked really bloody hard actually to, you know, to make sure that we could keep on, you know, the business would kind of grow and that we didn't kind of run out of money. Um, so it was tough times and I guess, for clients, for our clients, a lot of them, you know, they a lot of our product they were sold in supermarkets. So actually, in some senses, they were still they were still a, a market for them. Mm. But then what? And the thing that I found, and I still find really interesting about COVID, kind of off the back of it, was that it actually it drove a lot of creativity because it drove p- lots of business pivoted. So we had hallmarks from ours as well. So we we used to do events. We did we were doing like 10, 12 events a month mm. and that suddenly stopped overnight. And we we pivoted into doing cheese boxes. So we were selling, you know, boxes of cheese to people, which was, you know, thought we'd sell like, you know, 10 or something. And we ended up selling like 2,000 over that period, wow. which was slightly mad. Um but lots of businesses had to do that same thing. They pivoted into e-commerce. You know, one of our clients now that we work with Yorkshire Handmade Pies that James Sturdy does, you know, he could have launched a whole business off the back of selling pies, you know, sending pies through the post, you know, effectively couriering frozen pies out to people. And there's quite a lot of really good creative businesses that could took the opportunity around COVID to kind of re either pivot their business or launch your business or redo kind of what they were focusing on. So in, in lots of ways, as we came out of that first year of COVID, we I start we started getting a lot more work because there was an opportunity to tell the story about, you know, different different types of businesses, which I still I just think is really and a lot of people actually who, you know, left their jobs or they were furloughed and they decided at that time to leave their jobs and just to start something completely new. There's mm. so many new businesses were formed in that kind of 2020, 2021 mm. time. Um, it was really interesting, you know, coming out kind of a couple of years afterwards, you know, how many businesses have started then. So in some ways it was a really challenging time. And I was working from home anyway, so it's kind of, I was a bit annoyed that everyone else had realised that working from home was so good, you know. Mm. I was like, God, like my husband works from home now. <laughs> This is like my space, you know. So now I was like, everyone's just gagging in on it, like what's going on? Um, but it's definitely, you know, from a work from a working point of view, it completely changed how everyone worked, you know, for the better. Like I have had, we have had an office where we work a couple of days a week in an office. I've kind of given that up recently. We do more co working now, you know. But the the idea that you know that you can just work flexibly mm. and that's okay, and you can still work efficiently and creatively you know, in this hybrid working and environment. And cooperatively and collaboratively as well. <laughs> yeah, exactly. You know, you can still like, and it is that we always talk, you know, issues, you know, being able to do video calls rather than going to meetings all the mm. time. You, know, you don't, we have, I have some clients that I've never met, mm. ever met, you know, but I speak to them all the time. Mm. They feel like they're actually my, you know, my friends because we speak so constantly, but I've yeah. never actually probably met them face to face. And it, it's a, it's enabled business. It's enabled us to be able to work on, you know, more clients and be a, you know, kind of open to kind of more regional areas so that it's a much bigger kind of breadth of reach, if you see what I mean. Yeah. So I think it's only, even though it's been challenging, I think there's so many positives that came out of the back of, mm. you know, of COVID. And, you know, a lot of the people in my team, a lot of the people who work for me, their mums, you know, they work part time. Mm. 
they were probably for like furloughed or had challenges through COVID, you know, and they didn't want to go back into that work environment. They wanted to, they want to have a career, want to be ambitious, who want to, you know, do an amazing work and have fun and, you know, feel fulfilled with work. We don't necessarily want to sit in an office for 10 hours a yeah, day. Or, or on a bus for 10 hours a week, you know. Exactly. Yeah. Like, and it's so, you know, it's that, how that's changed working environments has kind of enabled, I think, a lot of people to work, you know, in jobs that they love, mm rather than having to kind of sacrifice their work work life balance mm. to do a job they feel they have to stay in because if they don't then there's no other option. You know, I think mm. a lot of people were working in jobs that maybe they didn't really like and mm. actually they kind of realise out the back of COVID that there's more opportunity. You can do, you know, you're not just there's no there's not one way of working now. Well I think after after we've you know the the sort of backlash of the uh you know, this commercial property retailers are saying everyone has to go back and keep paying us money. Um, after they've kind of gone quiet, we'll start seeing a lot more of like the benefits of being able to work, you know, around the world at any time and, and work in any market, essentially. Um, and we'll see a lot more. I think there's a lot more companies who are doing a lot of really interesting stuff in that area that we don't really hear about because the conversations either come back into work or, you know. Or else. Yeah. Um, the other thing that yeah. I want to ask about, so in terms of your kind of work-life balance and stuff through that period, did you, was there any tendency to kind of throw yourself into work and overwork or were you quite good at kind of keeping that, um, you know, I'm working these hours, I do however much work I need to do and then I stop and, you know, were you quite good at keeping that separation? I guess you've already got a bit of practice in the in the background from that. Yeah, and ultimately, you know, I've like lots of other people, you know, I've got a couple of kids, and you know, I, you can't you can't throw yourself into work because you've got responsibilities, so you have to balance those things out. Um, I love I, I love working. I've always loved working. I really enjoy the job that I have, but I'm also really sensible that it's like I I know that I'm really productive for like five or six hours a day, mm. and actually around that now because I can take my own time. I can go for swims. I can do other you know I can go for a lovely walk. You know I can do all those other things, and I understand more now actually that the balance of work life that work life. The reason I have my own business is I do have that work life balance, and I do have the time to be able to go and do things that. I need to do so mm. you know, picking the kids up from school early or mm. you know try I try not to work on Fridays mostly you know there's so actually the balance probably has evolved more um over the last few years where yeah I don't you know I work hard I work but I work well you, well. Work, you work for yourself you're not going to not work hard <laughs> yeah exactly but I don't you know I'm not I'm one of those kind of you know because entrepreneurs you know who mm. work in 100 hour weeks like mm. I just don't I don't really get that I just think it's you know you should be you should work hard do really good work and enjoy it but then you've got to have that downtime and balance as well because I can't be creative or be good at my job when I'm absolutely exhausted and I'm working all the time it doesn't mm. you know doesn't help anyone to be honest so mm. so yes I do I do I do strive for good work-life balance sometimes that doesn't happen but mm. um well, people that do work a lot, they don't have time to be online telling people that they work 80 hours a week, you know. <laughs> They're just dead. That takes up a lot of time. <laughs> yeah. I think there's, I do think there's a kind of, you know, I was a kind of like some kind of macho culture in, particularly in entrepreneurial businesses. Oh, I, yeah. think it's I think it's changing a bit now. But, you know, it's very male dominated. It's very, you know, you, yeah, you work really hard. You do this house. The only way to succeed is, you know, you hear a lot of podcasts, and, you know, people talking about it in that kind of way. You know, and I just think you know, there is, and that's, you know, great. Well done. But um, well, it's, yeah, ridi it's, it's ridiculous. Like it, 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 it's short term. It's, it's like at best, you know, you're going to get a couple of decades of being like that. And then your eyesight's going to go, your hearing's going to go, you know, like you're going to suffer other kind of, you're going to suffer other disabilities that are going to happen as you age and so on. And it's like, you know, this is not realistic for people. This is like, no, you know, like I, like I say to people, we only have a window of continence in our lives. <laughs> <laughs> Don't about it, bloody hell. Yeah. <laughs> so um, the other thing that I wanted to ask on this before I move on to the other questions is... Um, the face-to-face -face meeting so i'm guessing with pr there was a 
you know, pretty much yeah. an expectation with every client that you'd meet face to face. Has that changed or is that still there or do you kind of Yeah, so it is it's it's not still there, really. We don't I do I like a face to face meeting. I like going I like going to events, I like going and seeing, you know, like factories and mm. producers and farms and you know, that I think that's that's really important to really understand the nuts and bolts of a business. But but then equally, you know, you can do a lot of our work just online through video call so mm. it works fine or video or voice message which is like a neat thing um so yeah i think it's you don't have to do face-to-face meetings but it's nice like we started you know going back now to to more events and conferences and they're just brilliant it's just such a great buzz to be able to go mm. it's like a food and drink expo went a couple of weeks ago and it was so many people and it was so busy and it was brilliant you know you see trends and see diff- you meet different people so there's definitely a place for for face to face, and I think that's that will always be important. Mm. Um, but I think the kind of nuts and bolts of being able to run a business, I think, is much easier for everyone. You know, just to do video calls because everyone works. I mean, literally everyone works from home now. I, mean, I, mm. I can't. I'm really surprised when I do a video call with someone that are in the office. I'm like, wow, <laughs> you're in the office? Like, are you in there every day, or is that just today? And you know, because most of the time you just speak to people and they're just at home. And they're like, oh no, we have 100, percent you know, at home work now. Um, but yeah, but it is good. It's good to talk. Mm. Well, I know a lot of people who, like, because they had to work from home, they're like, no, <laughs> I'm going in the office. I do not want to work from home. Please, no, don't make me work from home. <laughs> <laughs> so um, let's do Brexit first. Get that out of the way. Uh, so Brexit question is basically, again, what has changed for you? Has anything changed for you since we have Brexit? since we have brexited and I, I mean you know can, can you even notice if there has been a change so has there been a change and 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 if so in what way i mean there has been for our clients um some clients yeah it's been really challenging so if you're a food producer and you've exported to europe for example um the 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 way of doing that now is almost impossible and lots of clients kind of just it was too expensive for them to explore mm. anywhere except you know there was a lot of talk wasn't there about you know international trade deals and stuff and that hasn't really materialized for lots of the clients that, that we work with um so that i think in that sense has been challenges and and challenge, very initially kind of the first kind of year or so you know challenges with staff that was you know mm. lots of food factories and food businesses rely on staff coming into there particularly in you know in seeds if you you know a vegetable grower for example mm-hmm. you come in and you would need to have kind of staff from europe for example to come over and do that work as they always traditionally have mm-hmm. and then that kind of stopped and a lot of um factory you know, a lot of factories and producers really struggled with staff you know they couldn't combine staff and it has completely changed their model mm-hmm. which i think actually in the in in the wider scheme was was good because a lot of factories used to do kind of 10 12 hour kind of shifts mm-hmm. and actually they had to change to to accommodate you know like work school hours mm. like shifts mm. and and balancing more flexibly when they probably couldn't do before because before they were just you know you're on a you're a worker you work for this amount of time but actually they had to go and in, into the pool of local the local mm. community to get kind of workers so i think that has kind of balanced out and changed a bit since then but then equally you know there, there were challenges around Brexit, but there's also a load of opportunities um we i do a lot of work with cheese producers obviously for fromage fromage um, I also did launch the virtual cheese awards in the pandemic as well, which was an online cheese awards um, that, I, that Sarah DeWitt, who I used to work with at Asda, kind of wanted to set up, which we did our fifth event last week, fifth year of our event last, last week, which is mad. It's still still going online, judging cheese online, um, which is mad. <laughs> don't ask me about it. Um, but, <laughs> but, um, but yeah, the opportunity to think about British cheese, you know, British cheese and British British produce has massively like it's going through a big renaissance mm. because you can't get it's much more difficult. Like it's hard much much. It's almost impossible for us to get French cheeses or Italian cheeses. They're really expensive. Mm. There's a lot less on the market. Mm. They're complicated. You know, we used to take weeks to get anything. You know, mm. from Europe, it's just crazy. Um, and so it's kind of it's opened up this kind of like opportunity for British producers to fill. And actually, you look in supermarkets now; they're much more focused on British produce, mm. much more focused on British stories. Um, and that's a great opportunity. That's a great opportunity for the back of Brexit, just mm. to kind of become more focused on celebrating what we grow and we make in our own country. 
because um, we'd make some amazing food. I think sometimes we've always been a bit of a hybrid nation and we we'll always import stuff and always will. You know, we always want to have oranges and we always want to have products that we can't necessarily grow ourselves. And we will always love that. But I think the opportunity to celebrate British produce is, is really good. And a little bit of that has come out of the back of Brexit. Mm. Well, I, I, and I would also say we can. We can grow anything, you know. The, yeah. the Icelandics can grow fruit and veg with geothermal power. We can grow anything here. So that's yeah. why I want a geothermal farm, growing our tea and coffee. And uh, yeah, yeah. It, it will happen. Also, you know, we want to go on to kind of like climate change and stuff. But, you know, how climate change affects our country and our, and our weather Farmers. conditions, there is, a, there, people don't really like talking about it, Mark, because mm. they think it's, you know, no, but that there is, I'm not saying it's a positive climate change, but the opportunity in climate change that we will be able to grow, like we grow grapes, wine mm. grapes, you know, in kind of all the way kind of up up in the UK and England mainly, but there are some other places. There's a vineyard in Leeds. It is a vineyard, yeah, literally down the road. Um, but you can, we don't, we can't grow table grapes. Table grapes are actually really hard to grow because they really need a lot more sunshine. But actually you're starting to see some more producers growing because the weather is warmer and it's, you know, you'll be able to grow things. So I think the opportunity to grow more things will be quite interesting through climate change. Not necessarily that's a good thing because we don't want our, our climate to warm, but... There are opportunities off the back of that as well. Um, okay, well, we may as well do that now since we've mentioned it. So, I, I mean, in terms of changes that you're seeing, I mean, obviously your your role is is to tell stories, and uh, like, so I guess I'll put it a different way. Like, how many, like, how often does that story have to come into the mix? And like, is it something that's prevalent or growing, or is it something that people kind of want to avoid and because a lot of a lot of marketing with food like if you think of food and food marketing unless it's like a processed branded thing most of the time they're going for a kind of you know earthy farmy like you know these are all it's like you know the stereotype of the farmer in the tweed and, and you know the wellies and stuff and it's all very twee and kind of 1950s and <laughs> you know it's all real real kind of food how is that? Is that still the story that you, you tell and people want to hear? Or is there any kind of, is the story changing, I guess? I think every single one of our clients, every single one of the brands we work with has to consider sustainability and the environment. So in every conversation that we have with all of our clients, you have to look at how that product impacts on the environment, mm. whether that's now or in the future. And I think there are some some brands and some businesses who kind of don't want to look at it or don't not sure about it. And I'm always like a bit of a kind of um, a doom bringer, really, because I'm always like you. You cannot ignore climate change. You cannot ignore sustainability. Whether it's you know those really big macro trends around, we're all going to have to eat less meat and dairy. I mean that's a fact. It doesn't. It doesn't mean that you're going to go and become 100% plant-based, but we are going to have to eat less meat and dairy. Mm. So we need to think about, you know, if you're a business in those sectors, what are you, what are your long-term plans going to be? How are you going to adapt and change mm. into that? And there was some brilliant work, you know, brilliant work from producers, like meat producers who are looking at regenerative farming practices, who are, yeah, doing kind of, you know, growing growing vegetables inside, you know, mm. doing all, like all kinds of really amazing stuff. Like, but even at the very basic level, knowing your numbers, you know, what is your impact on the environment is really, you know, we know from media, they, we get asked about it all the time, you know, is it a sustainable brand? Like we can't, if we can't send any samples out to media, that is wrapped in plastic mm. like it's a complete no-no like you cannot ex expect that that is going to go down well you know you've got to think about how your brand is presented so the environment sustainability is just it's just so interwoven into everything whether you as a brand or a product want to accept that or not mm. you know we you've got to include it in the comms and i think that's just getting you know kind of not worse but it's becoming much more relevant i think over the last couple of years and you know government challenges around you know what our you know ambitions are as a nation and what you know, getting to net zero and all those kind of things being kind of watered down isn't helpful because it may it just causes confusion mm. but there is there is so many great things happening in sustainability and, and 
we work with an organization called Future Food Movement, and they are basically championing food and drink business to work collaboratively together to create kind of healthy, sustainable diets. Mm. Um, and to, that we're only going to be able to fix the climate crisis if we all of us work, you know, all these big businesses that initially were very competitive, yeah. work together to find solutions and share knowledge. Mm. And that's the only way we're going to be able to make a difference. We can't make a difference on our own. So, you know, it's not, I say to clients, you know, don't, don't be embarrassed. You think, well, I haven't got a plan for this, so I don't know how we're going to address, you know, X, Y, and Z. Mm. So we just won't talk about it. But I'm like, it's much better to say we're on a journey. We don't, mm-hmm. we haven't got all the answers. Mm. We really want to become more sustainable. We want to be more environmentally friendly. We're really looking about our supply chain, how we source ingredients. Mm. But we're not quite there yet. But we're looking at it. It's much better to say that that you're on this journey than just try to ignore it because I think there's that causes a lot more issues. Mm. Um, you know, and like, we have lots of kind of conversation around greenwashing. I'm doing a talk actually a couple of weeks about greenwashing and brands trying to, you know, make claims, environmental claims, and mm. they get they get found out. Mm. And actually from a PR and comms point of view, that's much worse if you try to make a claim yeah. or, you know, make up some m- numbers. I've seen brands, you yeah. know, make up their numbers, their carbon numbers, and actually it's not true. And they get pulled out for it. Mm. That can damage a brand. And it's it's a non-story, isn't it? It's like it's such an unimaginative kind of like oh, just throw some like it's such a half-assed kind of throw some numbers at it. It's like that's not a story. Like people want to hear. Like people would be fascinating to hear how shocked you are to find out about such and such, or like realize how difficult it is to do x but i'm going to try and do it anyway and we're going to think of things and like you know and it is a whole discovery process like i think the story there is in that kind of damascene moment of like oh oh yeah like this this is a real and it's a real big challenge but it's something that we've got to do yeah it's difficult but we can do this like and we can because our brand's really super clever and we're all clever people and we're a great company and we work together and we're going to do this as a team and we're going to make a difference that's a story you know like oh we've uh, invested in a tree over here is is boring <laughs> yeah and it is you do get the what you know what's your sustainability message or oh, this is our sustainability and they have like one answer for it and it's like we really value sustainability because this that and the other and it's like well, that's brilliant. Well done. Kind of revolutionise you know, our you know, sector is your story. Yeah. That's what you want to be it's saying. Like, what, are you, what are you doing, and what are those challenges? And you know, when, and just trying to be competitive. You know, to say we did it first, or we, you know, we we got B Corp and we're the best, mm-hmm. and we've done it. You know, everyone else is rubbish. Like, I'm not saying that a lot of brands do that, but there are there is a bit of that. You know competitiveness. No, it's like we're not. We can't compete in climate. You know, we can't. It's not. It's not the right thing to do, and I always, I'm always very con- careful about sustainability stories because I'm like, like, is it that good? Like, is it like in reality? If a journalist decided to really dig deep into it, mm. could you really back it up? Mm. Are you just doing because you want to be? You want to have first mover advantage? Mm. You know, you want to show off. Like, is that the right motivation? You know, let's let's look at it more in depth. Is it is what you're trying to announce just something you should do anyway? Mm. Like, just is it that much news? You know, newsworthy? I think there's definitely there is. You've got to have more really honest conversations about sustainability, environmental credentials, and just and look lo- much more longer term than you know we've done this one thing and look how great we are. I think it's an opportunity as well to operate in an area where you can fail. Do you know what I mean? Which is very rare now because it's like, you know, you can't be seen to fail. You can't be seen to be wrong to a poly. <laughs> like, you know, there's a certain level of that. I mean, obviously, there's the whole thing of like doing apologies are good. And that's a whole kind of story in itself. Um, but a lot of the time it is kind of, no, we didn't do anything wrong. And let's just move on, move on from that story. But the yeah. sustainability area gives you that kind of we're discovering all of this this is all new to us it's all experimentation we're going to make mistakes we're going to get things wrong and that's good actually because we can learn from it and then we can get things right so yeah take advantage like we, of that we're trying our hardest you know we're trying to do the best that we can yeah um you know we all make mistakes and it's better to say we've maybe we have not we've not done that well enough or we're not sure how that's going to work yeah, it's much we, better yeah. Now, and from a consumer brand point of point of view, you're much more likely to go and want to buy a product from a food brand or drink brand, 
you know, if they're open and honest and they kind of get it and they, you know, they hold their hands up and just be authentic about what they're trying to deliver, you know, you're much more likely to do that than you are to go and buy from someone that you think might have lied to you, mm. you know, trying to make claims about sustainability that aren't true. You know, you're not going to want to buy products from them. And, and actually, as a younger generation are coming through, the Gen Z and the Alphas, you know, they will vote with their feet. You know, they will not buy brands, you know, buy products and brands they think that aren't authentic. So mm. it's really, it is, there's no, and there also isn't really a right or wrong answer in it. It's quite, it's quite, it is quite hard, tricky to navigate. So I'm always like, just be truthful and authentic mm. in your journey and that will the truth will out you know that will always be good for your reputation the more you try and you know bury your head in the sand it would it never works you know we've seen that through everything you know from pr if you try to um, forget that something's going on hide from it it will bite you in the bum yeah it's a, the barbara streisand effect yes <laughs> <laughs> exactly um so right let's we've done brexit with that climate change. do we want to say any more on climate before i move us on just like i want to give you that opportunity no i think it's just i think it's a really interesting kind of um subject area that i think we all need to make i think we all need to educate ourselves on a lot more mm. i think sometimes we just assume that we don't know anything or it's something that's technical or mm. you know we can or that we could fix it by just turning a light off you know mm. i think we all as, as people need to really understand the impact of our own decisions decisions of our communities mm. and the decision of big brands mm. and businesses and how they're affecting climate change and what you know and i think the more you understand and educate yourself about it the better decisions you'll make in the future mm. um there are some you know obviously some businesses some brands that are not doing a great job on it and i think that's been kind of hidden a little bit so, you know, we should vote with our feet to make sure that, you know, climate, this is our future, you know, this is the future of our children's mm. lives. So we should be making positive decisions. Mm. And our present. I mean, I so do you do you remember the day 22, 2022, when we had the 39 degrees? I mean, like, how was that to work in? Were you working that day? Did yeah, you work or were you just like, oh, it's too hot? It's like I like I think I think I, we closed like all the windows and all the curtains mm. of our house. We were working from home. The kids went to school madly, um, and just kind of hid in the house until it got stopped. I remember going to Europe. We go to France a few years ago, and that was it was like a forty-two degree mm. day in like in southern France. And um, that's what we did. You close all the windows and close everything, and you hide in your house because it's so you know. Hopefully, it'd have air conditioning, which we did not, obviously. But mm. yeah, and that's the thing, isn't it? It's like, do I want to hand you know? my children and my children's children, you know, a world that's on fire, because that's ultimately, you know, it sounds like this is kind of, you know, dramatic kind of things. Well, no, but we've seen it every year. All of the world is on fire again. Oh, it's still on fire. Yeah, it's like we're coming kind of commonplace, you know, that we need to, you know, we all need to do something. And some of it is in our our power Mm. and some of it isn't, you know, but I do think, yeah, we, we need to be more urgent, I think, in terms of, what's hap- what's actually happening out there and I, I get I did get frustrated sometimes because I get a lot of kind of I like obviously I, I do kind of support you know, dairy companies and meat and I have I do ha- I don't eat a huge amount of meat but I have reduced kind of the meat that I eat and I do work with lots of plant-based companies but it's, it's sometimes a very kind of like black and white answer to the climate change yeah. and it really frustrates me because it's like it, the answer to climate change isn't just to be 100% plant based, and that's mm. then that's that's going to that's going to turn, change everything. That's not how the world works. Not how our agriculture works. You know, in not Britain particularly, work. not how people work. You know, we should be encouraging people to eat less meat. Mm. You know, and eat healthier, healthier products, healthier food. You know, more kind of fresh ingredients and and things. That's that's what our job is, I think. Mm. But I think it's really confusing to people when they're going, well, you just have to never eat meat and dairy. We shouldn't even raise meat and dairy, and that should that's the you know the end, and that that's the that's the answer. Mm. I think it's really unhelpful, actually, and um, it frustrates me when people kind of go, that's the answer. Just don't eat, just don't eat meat. It's like mm. it's not it's not really the answer. It's like it's. Yes, eat less, eat better quality, you know, have better rearing, you know, think more about the environment, the biodiversity. Make of it travel less they, distance. Make it travel less distance. You know, we are, I always say, you know, in the UK and Great Britain, you know, we are, we're like kind of the an Amazon really, because we are a temperate nation. So we rely on 
rain and grass. So it's the perfect place to raise livestock because we have this beautiful, lush grasslands in so many parts of our country. Mm. So, And some of those lush grasslands can be turned into producing more produce, but a lot of them probably can't because you think about the hills of Wales, you know, where sheep graze. Mm. You can't really turn any of that into, you know, growing vegetables particularly. Mm. So there's like, we need to adapt, but we also need to utilise the what the greatness of our country and what you know what we can what food we can produce on it and it's not about just going oh we're just going to eat you know mm. it's not going to be enough <laughs> yeah <laughs> um yeah i i mean obviously uh, there's hours and hours and hours of material in that that area and the whole kind of topic and there's plenty of material already about it um, so I'll move us along. So I expect this, you, you probably do a fair amount of work in this area, but at this point, um, what, what I want to look at is the amount of time that you have to spend on it and whether you think it gives you the return on investment that you want, you know, like does several hours on social media give you all of the exposure, the returns and, and so on that you want? I'm guessing working in PR, you've got this down pat and you're like, yep, yeah, I know exactly what I'm doing. I put this post out and it gets everything that I want and it's really easy. And... <laughs> yeah, I wish that was the, that was the answer. So, I, we tend to focus, I take very much traditional PR in the sense of like we do great storytelling into kind of, you know, the media. And, the, and when I say the media, that also includes social media. Mm. So we tell stories on social media. And they can be probably the most powerful to- stories that you can tell because you're influencing people directly, mm. you know, without having to go through the medium of a newspaper or a TV show or whatever. Um, we do kind of manage some social media for clients, but not not really. There's a lot of people that are much better at doing you know, proper social media management mm. and content creation than we do. Um, but to me, it's like, you know, I've, I've worked in PR for a really long time. Social media is just another way of just telling a, mm. it's just another way of telling a story. Um, and there's, you know, for me, on the flip side of that, I find social media really interesting just from a trends point of view. Like I, I get a lot of like stories and, um, you know, snippets of things that are happening in the world through, you know, through TikTok, through Instagram, even through LinkedIn, you know, there's, there's so much news and stuff and conversation that happens. I know, I know a lot of people are like, oh, social media is really bad and it is. And there are elements of it that are negative. But for me, I just find it really interesting. You know, you can find some amazing, like, trends that happen on TikTok with food, you know, mm-hmm. like some slightly, slightly crazy ones. But I find it a real resource of just, you know, seeing what normal people are doing, like how normal are people are eating. Because there's a lot in marketing and kind of, like, advertising and PR sometimes. You can make a lot of assumptions about how people live. Mm-hmm why my social degree was really helpful because you try to make it something you, you I mean, I get this quite a lot you know a London you know a young like new marketer or living in London you know never gone anywhere else in the whole of the country you know in the country trying to kind of create campaigns that target a certain type of audience it's like but you don't necessarily probably don't really understand how people yeah. really eat. nobody else in the country lives like that like nobody yeah, like- if you've only been in London you don't know anything about the rest of the country yeah, exactly. And they have a very kind of perception of, you know, what is northern, mm. which is also I get really pissed off about because like that isn't yeah, you know, like being northern, what does that, you know, what does that that mean? Is it kind of it kind of plays into kind of a stereotype. So mm. actually looking at social media of normal people around the country, around the world, and how they how they eat, how they drink, how they interact with, you know, certain stories. How they see and present helpful. themselves as well. Yeah. yeah. There was an amazing, this is like not social media related, but there was an amazing documentary probably about, I don't know, 10 years ago or something. And it was like a look, it was about, it was a look into family dinners mm. in the UK. So they went around to people's, a bit like kind of goggle box, but for like, dinner yeah. and then films kind of people eating dinner in different families in different like different parts of the country you know different environments um just to see how they ate and it was so interesting and fascinating because you think that everyone eats exactly the same way or we eat the same food and it's so different mm. diverse and influenced by so many different things and you see the joy of people eating together and that connection that you get that nostalgia and i and I think that's, and yeah, I just love that kind of way. And I always go back to that when I talk about food, because that's what social media gives us. It gives you an insight to people, how people live. So I think, yes, you can tell your story on social 
you know, you can promote your brands. Mm. I mean, it's much harder to promote your brand now on social than it ever used to be. If you are just a hundred percent e-commerce business, it's all, you know, the amount of money you have to pay for acquisition is just huge. And it's, you know, so I always go back to again, like if you just tell really great stories, wherever you place those stories, you know, you will succeed because people connect with like those that we used to connect with people's stories, aren't we, all the time? And mm. we don't really like being advertised to particularly. So if you can get your story across on social media or on different platforms, then that'll always benefit you. But but then equally, you know, where can you be inspired and where is that inspiration coming from? And it is just, you know, normal it's normal people like you and I and that's you need to market your products to those people mm. and understand that nuances of how people live. I mean, the sort of the targeting tools and so on that you have when you do engage in social campaigns. I mean, do they, uh, I mean, uh, I'm just assuming they work really, really well. And that seems to be kind of the thing. I mean, is, is that the case? Do they kind of find the, the audiences that you want them to find? Do, do you find like, that? I mean, it's anecdotal, isn't it? We we haven't got an objective, you know, scientific measure of this. But do you do you, do you get that feeling that they are, you know, they they really good delivery vehicles for for that? I think they're just they're just one one element of a marketing strategy. I don't think they're the be on end or I think it's really really hard to pinpoint an audience on social media. I think mm. it's almost impossible. Um, it used to be done a lot lot better with things like Facebook and Instagram, but I think it has its challenges and I always say you know you you just need to find your tribe you know you can create your own tribe of people who are passionate about what your brand is and what you believe in and actually if you can create authentic relationships with your customers on social media then you will succeed and those brands that have done that you know can then sell and can market what Mm -hmm. they're doing in a much more you know authentic way but I think it's a lot it's a much harder space, I think, to promote your brands in nowadays mm. because it is very busy. It's very pay to play. Mm. Um, and I think there are brands that just, you know, and some probably very successfully just focus on social, that e-commerce you know, just through social. Mm. And it can, you know, it does work, obviously. But I do think there's a, there's a, a kind of argument if you need to spread your story much wider. You know, we talk about touch points a lot. Like when I first started out in PR, you might have like, you know, five touch points. A touch point is you've seen, say you want to buy, you know, I don't know, a Ritz cracker. Mm. And, you know, you got, you see the brand, you know, they've got a new flavor out, blue cheese flavor, Ritz cracker. I don't know. Have they done that? They should do that with me. Um, <laughs> but, uh, but like, you know, you see it on social, you see it on Instagram post, you see it in a newspaper article about it, you hear it on telly, you know, your mate says, oh, I bought these amazing blue cheese crackers. Mm. Like, and they know that you probably see that brand five different places and that might make you go and purchase the product. Mm-hmm. Nowadays, because the media is so vast, it's probably about 20 touch points mm. before a customer or someone will make that purchase decision. So you need, people need to see your brand in like a thousand different places. Mm. They've got to see it everywhere. You Mm. can't just rely on it being social media and repurposing, you know, an ad or content all the time to help you then Mm. see it. You kind of want the the customer, you want to see that product, whatever it might be, you know, everywhere you want your mate to be like saying about it. You want to see it on Twitter. You want to see it on, you know, a newspaper article. You want to see it on telly. You want to see it, Mm. you know, whatever billboard ad, you know, you've got to kind of increase those touch points. So social media just is just a stream is an element of that. Mm. But actually the more that you can tell your story, you know, put your product in lots of different places, Mm -hmm. the more likely you are to make a sale. Mm. So before I move off this question, I just want to ask you, in terms of your media toolkit, sort of how how far do you go with any of these things? Like, are there are there certain things? Like, what's your what's your area of a kind of I guess creative expression within the job? Like, is it all just the story creation, or do you really like doing a photo shoot, or is it about writing copy, or like what were the things that that kind of interested you? And especially within this social media area, like. I think going forward, what's going to happen, we're going to see like, you know how IT was basically, it wasn't an in-house thing initially. Everyone subcontracted to sort of IT specialists and so on. And then they were like, hang on, we we need people in-house for it. We need the knowledge in-house and we need to build certain things in-house. And this needs to be a part of the company. 
I think we're going to see that with social media. We're going to start getting, you know, proper full on editor. Like there will be social media people who are, you know, they film it, they edit it, they, they light it. Like they've got certain film and media skills, TV skills, audio skills or whatever, photography skills, but they're a person and or a team. I kind of, maybe it builds onto the marketing de department or whatever, but I think there's a space that that's coming because everyone is going to have to have s stories that they tell in this space. So, um, yeah, what are the areas that you like and what are the, the, the things that you maybe like to do more of, if you could, like, are you a secret filmmaker, I guess is what I'm asking. No. <laughs> um, I don't know, like, I, what do I love doing and what do we do? I guess... PR is seen very much as a bit of a, a dark art. Mm. Like no one really knows what no one really knows what PR is. So it's because it's because it's not one thing. It's a thousand things. Mm. So our clients, when we have a brand we're working with, yes, it's about getting their story right, and that's getting that story right is not about them telling me what their story is. It's mm. about us really kind of inquiring and digging deep into what actually is the story and how has that been told in the right way. So that's kind of you know a job in of itself. And then, you know, from a strategy point of view, it could be anything. Yeah, write, writing press releases, um, doing copy, doing every, run lots of different events. Um, like, what else do you do? Yeah, lots of different types, lots of events, lots of kind of one-to-ones, um, media interviews, photography shoots, um, taste tests, like just general, we do a lot of work, you know, meeting journalists and, you know, understanding what they what they want. Um there's so it's kind of quite quite broad and I guess for me social is you know part of that is influencer management and kind of you know getting that story out there in the right way um and there's no one thing that I really like the only one thing that I can I guess we all wait we all focus on is just that story it is mm. about you know and it isn't it's and it sounds simple and I'm like you can dig into your story and you've got a good story that will you know it will naturally flourish into all of those places where you need it to be then read about or looked at um but it's surprising how difficult that is sometimes when you know, we might see a story that's like different to what you see it as, you know, and there could be, you know, really interesting stories about community and people and pride and, you know, that they would just dismiss probably as a brand. Well, that's not really relevant because it's not kind of what we want to talk about, but mm -hmm. actually there's something really unique and lovely about that. So we kind of ask lots of questions. That's our, our biggest skill, I guess, as a PR is, the ability to ask, you know, thousands of questions. And I always say to clients, I'm like, like when we're onboarding you and talking, we're going to ask you lots of questions, mm. like a lot of questions, mm. like questions that you don't want probably to answer, but we need to find all the skeletons. We need to find everything. So the ability to kind of really dig, dig, dig deep into a story, into a brand, into a product, that bit I love, that's like the thing that I really enjoy. Mm. Um, and I think probably the same for lots of our, lots of my team as well. Mm. But yeah, and social kind of, you know, yeah, it plays a part of that. Like I'm, I'm not a great kind of, yeah, feel, like feel a lot of people care. So you need to be more on, go and do more online and go and do more talks and things, which I am trying to do. But um, I've always been, you know, behind the scenes. That's like mm. my job is behind the scenes. But I know I use LinkedIn a lot, you know, for, for my kind of personal profile, which works quite well. I basically mm. have months on LinkedIn about <laughs> food issues. Um, but... <laughs> It works. Like, <laughs> it, it works so it's fine uh, having an opinion having you know and I think you know, I was always taught when I was you know working in PR and agencies you know you, I wasn't allowed to have an opinion I wasn't allowed to anything that might rock rock the boat right. and actually it's taken a bit of time to kind of get out of doing that but uh, you now need I to rock the boat now <laughs> yeah like I think and there are things that you need to rock you know rock the boat about it's not about you know, being rude about other brands or yeah. anything, but it's, it is about just yeah having a bit of an opinion, getting to, you know, thinking about what it is that we're trying to do, and social media is quite a good place to do to do that mm. and just have a bit of discussion about stuff, which I think I quite like. Mm. So I do use social media, but it's more about causing arguments, <laughs> <laughs> all about engagement. <laughs> yes, um, that's right. That's the word. <laughs> uh, I had another question there. Have I forgotten it? I think I've forgotten it. It might come back to me. Um, so I'll move us on to the change question. 
So you work for yourself, so this can sometimes be a bit harder when you work for yourself because you kind of can change things. Um, but, yeah, if you could change any three things about your work right now, what would you change? It's a difficult question because I really love my job. I love kind of everything that I do most of the time. I really, I guess, what could I change? Recently, I've really struggled in Leeds to find kind of space for us to work. Like, we have to have like an office mm. but then not to necessarily have co-working is there's quite a lot of space in Leeds for kind of creatives but it's some of it is kind of disappearing mm. so actually to me I'd like to be able to be more kind of visible in Leeds City Centre mm. we work at Avenue HQ which is quite which we really enjoy but yeah I don't know it seems that a lot of the co-working place in the offices they're very expensive they're mm. very kind of they're not flexible enough mm. and I find that actually I would like to change that I guess um how would I change my working? I don't know, really, because it's, I mean... Why is it all in town as well? Like, surely yeah. most of it should be, there should be co-working hubs in regions around the city, you know. I wish, I mean, maybe they probably are, but, like, I kind of live in East Leeds, and we had an office that was, uh, like, a Regus office that was kind of just outside the city centre, mm. and it was, you know, everyone would, you have to kind of travel to it, and it was, I had a car park that was free, and that was great. You could just, you know, it was very, really flexible. Then they started charging for car parking, and it was costing, mm. like, £10 a day to charge. In a, but there's no other parking anywhere around there. So they completely shot themselves in the foot. It's like, if you decide to be a regional hub for people in the local community, then then charging for, like, parking doesn't make any sense, because... Mm. And I just, we just, well, just like, we let our contract go, because I was like, I can't. We, but it's, it's, it's not, like it's the, not flexible. Job centre and, uh, like, Crossgates Library, these places that are, like, you know, public publicly owned built well publicly owned buildings but um they could have been spaces like they could have been co-working spaces incubators like you know and, and i know they're doing like the british library with the bipc centers the business information uh sorry intellectual property centers like uh, they're all over and that's really good but make more of it you know and a bit of an investment and a like you know a bit more talks and I think you could make more of it, and I think there's, there'd be a lot of take up of that that opportunity. I think. Yeah, I think it's, for me, kind of the one the one thing that I really noticed when I went and started working for myself after working in offices and you know corporate organisations for a long time was how many people work for themselves. Like mm. it's a whole whole community, it's a whole massive like workforce that you know work by themselves or work with a couple of other people, and they necessarily want they don't really want to go work in office all the time. They want to be, have have flexibility yeah. in where they you know where they want to go to, and I, I think that that isn't really catered for mm. enough. And yeah, they say like yeah, there, there are kind of opportunities, there are places that you can go to, but I wish there was more hubs. I wish there was mm. kind of really places that people can all come to. Those creatives can go to, or people who work by themselves and kind of be in this kind of environment where mm. they're inspired and they yeah. And it does. There are some great co-working spaces, and don't get me wrong, I'm not saying that there aren't. There are, but I wish there was more of them. Yeah, a bit more. It doesn't feel as accessible as it should, kind of thing. Yeah, I think it's hard to find. When I was, yeah, because I'm at Garford, so I could have looked to, you know, have, there are some kind of off, like co working office spaces near here, but they were really expensive. They're just really mm. out and really expensive. It wasn't any, there's nowhere really kind of near here that I could just go pop into. For, yeah, you're kind of like, you know. how did you, how did you work out your price point for this? Like, who are you, who are you targeting here? Who's got that amount of money that they can easily just sort of throw away for something that, that's like that? Yeah, and also it's like no one wants to work in office, you know, five days a week now. Mm. So mm. how are you catering for people who want to work together in a team? Because we're a team, there's like three or four of us in our team, and we come together kind of once a week and we work together. And we love it because mm. it's just, you know, but I don't want to have an office five days a week, but the opportunity to kind of have some space that, you know, for like two or two days a week or something, mm. Where it's guarantees, but it doesn't really exist. It's you know, and they're you know, co work. A lot of them are in city centre, which mm. is which is fine. But then that is a bit of a pain. So I wish there was, I wish there was more of that. I wish people thought more. Well, I guess you know, the model itself of office, you know, isn't great at the moment. So maybe mm. that's going to work a bit. But mm. but yeah, I was did. I've been quite frustrated with that, to be honest. Mm. So co working spaces is that is that one change? <laughs> <laughs> co-working spaces would be yeah would be that right, way one i guess to me it's like a you know pr is seen it's really difficult i there are a lot of bad pr people out there mm. and i'm not like saying that in a kind of way of i'm just doing but that's a, that's a market necessity as well though isn't it if you're a big expensive 
thing that's made a big expensive mess you need someone who costs a lot of money and will do the deed but that you know is kind of okay with the morality of it let's, let's put it that way <laughs> yeah it has a question your kind of morality with your kpr sometimes um fixing lots of issues but i kind of I think we get, like, PR people get a bit of a bad rap. And I, and I have those conversations with, like, brands who are like, oh, we had a PR agency, but they were absolutely rubbish. And they just, like, charged loads of money and didn't do any work. Um, you know, I've had, we had one a client work with now, and they were like, yeah, we had a PR agency that got us no coverage at all for the whole year. <laughs> like, just, and it's just, and I find it really infuriating. And I wish could we could educate people about kind of what, you know, what PR is and mm. what it can do mm. and the benefit of working with PRs. Because mm. I think people see it as a bit of a kind of an add on. It's a nice to have. And, and actually, I think the PR is much more, is a really, really important part of your marketing kind of strategy mm. and can be a really cost effective way of, of doing it. So I guess if I could change anything, it'd be like to educate people more about you know the power of PR and and what it is and what it isn't. And actually, if you had a bad experience, don't take that as every PR person is going to try and swindle you out of money and do nothing. Like because mm. that's certainly what we do. So yeah, a bit of a better understanding of PR. I don't know how to do that, but the PR, I PR. Mean, I think because you know if you're setting uh, speaking from my own experience and talking to other people but if you're setting up a business and you're you know you're going through whatever amount of planning that you're going to do and all research that you're going to do which is never enough you should all do more everybody uh including me but that kind of you think about the marketing you think about the brand but you should be thinking about pr like rather than a social media strategy which you should have eventually or a marketing strategy which you should have eventually you want to start with the pr strategy don't you like how am i going to relate to the public at large and then to my specific audience and and so on and what is the story that i want to tell what am i what am i about and obviously that's really difficult when you're first starting out because you're like nothing i'm just trying to get anyone to pay attention to me and buy anything at all um <laughs> But yeah, I think that, that, yeah, I mean, that would be, because you, like I say, you automatically think of the marketing, you think of the branding, but you don't think of that wider strategy and, and, and the story necessarily. And PR kind of, it does sit in marketing, but actually, it's sort of I've always been told that it's outside of it. Yeah, so PR should always kind of report into seeing the most senior person in the business, really, because it should be about the CEO and the kind of the, the whole brand story rather mm -hmm. than just, you know, an, an element of it. Um, so we should sit kind of within within that. And actually, you know, everything that you do in your business, if you're whatever business you are, mm -hmm. a small business or a big business, you know, how you present yourself on social media, how you present yourself on your website, how you present yourself in interviews, whatever those things are, that's all PR. So mm -hmm. you've got to kind of be able to get that story, your story right and tell it in a way that's really compelling. Mm -hmm. So... If you don't go do that, you can you can fall quite foul of, of stuff because it's not you're not really kind of communicating well enough about who you are and what you stand for. Mm. Um, I'm not saying PR is right for for everyone. Something you know, sometimes you can dip in and out of it, and that's fine. But um, but yeah, I do think it's something that you should consider mm. as when with what you're doing because then I get lots. We get lots of brands saying we just want to be in the newspaper, and I'm like, well, no, you don't. Like, <laughs> why <laughs> blow up one of your factories? You get in the newspaper. <laughs> It's like, yeah, exactly. You know, what what's your objective? What are you trying what what's the problem you're trying to solve? You know, what you just trying to sell more product, trying yeah. to get more people to come visit, or are you trying to, you know, talk about how great you are, or are you trying to go on a journey on sustainability, or you know, try to grow your reach or get more employ more people, or you know, what are the, what are you trying to achieve? You can understand what that you're trying you're to trying achieve to and you're brand because it. you're better than them and you hate them. Yeah. <laughs> you just want to just be genius, yeah, we want to just, you know, just want to compete against all these other brands and be really mean about them. You know, like you've got to just, you know, there's no, it's getting into the newspaper or a magazine, you know, is only, that's only, a, that's a tactic. It's a part of it. Yeah. So you've got to understand yeah, there's that. No value in that. There's no value in that. There's no value in, you know, one piece of coverage either. Yeah. You know, you've, your value is on, it's a building touch points about mm. building kind of reach. So you've got to tell that story in lots of different places, lots of different ways. But mm. yeah, so that's probably one of them. I don't know what my third one is. <laughs> Three is quite hard. More money and time. They're, they're, they're More money and time. Yeah, people to pay their invoices on time. That'd be good. But yeah, that, no, that's, that's a one. common one as well. People to yeah. pay quickly. 
<laughs> yeah, small businesses, you kind of think, yeah, that's, and I guess like it is, you know, running a business is, you know, is a, is a lot, you know, it's, it's just challenging running a, running a business and employing people and working, you know, trying to get your finances all sorted and yeah. chasing invoices and all that kind of stuff is exhausting, but, but it's fine. I like it. Mm. It's hard enough to do badly, never mind to do well, so... I know, well, quite, yeah. <laughs> so, uh, my final question is on universal basic income. I assume you know what UBI is. Yep. Uh, so, if there was a universal basic income, how do you think that might have changed your work? Would it have made any difference for you? Would you have set up on your own earlier? Would you have not? Like, I know, I'm always like, I'm a big, I'm a big believer in kind of striving for striving for success like but I also believe in fairness and that we should support all people in society mm. so a universal basic income is a great idea to help people to feel stability in their lives and that they give them the confidence that they can pay what they need to pay and then be able to then go on to work after that mm. um would it change of how I operated I don't know. I think, you know, I think there's an element of like the struggle <laughs> or the fear, you know, of, mm. of not having enough money, mm. the fear of can I afford to pay my mortgage kind of thing mm. kind of does drive, drive me, you know, it makes me work harder in some ways. So, and I guess the ability to as well alongside that, to allow people to be creative and to choose work that, inspires them because I said you know going right back to the beginning of actually when you work in an office or in a corporate environment you work because you have to and you don't mm. necessarily you feel like you're trapped in that because you have because you want to got to pay your mortgage you've got to do all those things if you could take some of that fear away would that enable people to really follow their hearts and do things that they're passionate about you know I do this because I'm genuinely passionate about it it's something that I love mm. um and if you if you had a universal basic income that could enable people to follow their passions a bit more, mm-hmm. that can only be a good thing. Mm. Mm. Yeah, it's 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 a complicated one. That it's really it and it's an interesting like it's just an interesting one to discuss and just get people's opinions on it. And it's like it's really not widely known, um, and that's why you know like. Most of these questions, they serve a number of purposes. So this is another way of me asking, like, you know, how much does the money kind of factor into things? And, you know, if that was different, would you make different choices kind of things? Because sometimes you, you have to make financial choices based on your circumstances and, like, needs. And other times it's just like, I want all the money in the world. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, yeah, I think it's an interesting one to talk about. So yeah. I don't think anyone that could have set their own business up or certainly could have people that I know, you know, go into it thinking they're going to be millionaires. Mm-hmm. Like that's, I mean, I guess there are some examples of people who set their business up and suddenly they're like, you know, in Sunday times rich list. Mm-hmm. But I think we most mostly do it. And I certainly do it for, you know, having a good work life balance, doing something that I really care about and that, you know, and if I can pay my mortgage and, you know, it's also to have the autonomy. Like, so my understanding of what makes a good job good role is a sense of purpose a sense of mastery and a sense of autonomy within your role so you know what you're doing how to do it and why you're doing it and and you have some sense of control and ownership over that and like you say all of these people and so many people that are you know self-employed small businesses and so on they have worked in big companies and big industries like you have and sort of come out and a lot of the time it's for that that freedom. And I think it's really beneficial for the economy as well because you help people who have worked in these big international companies and so on that have done things and have ways of doing things and have very successful solutions and methods to some stuff and then other stuff you'd be like, they were failing on that. I can change that now. I'm not working there. So it's, a, it's good grounding. But, yeah, I think more flexibility needs to be built within to the into the workforce. But then I think one of the things that makes it difficult, strangely, is this sort of everything being online and, and how difficult now it is to verify who who is who. Are they the person that they're saying they are kind of thing? Um, but that's, again, that's a whole topic for another day. Um, but, yeah, feel free to respond to any of that. I do think, I think there is, you know, from setting my own business up and kind of you know, being entrepreneurial, I said that and kind of like 
things. But, you know, the, if we can encourage more people to kind of to know and to give the confidence that they can set their own business up, mm. you know, doing something, whatever that might be, you know, we call it you know, a side hustle, you know, doing mm. something. But the ability to create entrepreneurial businesses, you know, is something that we should be really proud of and to be doing more of mm. because it's, it is, you can do that. You know, there is, that is a, you know, a, an option for lots of people. But we could have, I think we could have told that we have to go into work and we have to do this, you know, go to university and go to this certain route, you know, to mm. kind of success and then retire at a certain age. And I, I don't think the work is like that nowadays. I think it's changing. Mm. And I think the more that we can give confidence to young people that, there isn't just one route, you know, one way of working and one way of living that you can do something that, you know, have the confidence and ability to be able to do something mm. with their lives that they're passionate about. That that's they're cre- you know, creative. Mm. And also, about- if you're gonna, if you, you know, especially if you're young, if you're gonna go into, you're gonna end up getting loads and loads of debt. Don't incorporate start a company put all the debt on the company and then <laughs> if it, if you're like you know then the company can go and the debt can go with it so that's the yeah. do that <laughs> less risky yeah don't have yeah. personal debt put it all on a like all incorporate there, yeah. It. Yeah. um so yeah this is the point where i throw it over to you so anything that we haven't discussed that you'd like to discuss or raise uh, you don't have to but if the if you you know, any campaigns coming up or any burning issue to talk about something in particular, this is the point for you to do that. If you don't have any of that, you can just give us your socials and let us know where, where people can find you. Oh, that's okay. I remember my socials. Nothing really. I mean, obviously, if people, you know, there are p- businesses that want to you know, do it on two things, really. It's like if you're a food and drink business or a hostile or whatever, you want some PR or some advice or some chats, then, you know, I'm always open for coffee and cake in town or anywhere. Or like cheese. If it involves cake or cheese, I'm, <laughs> I'm there, literally in, in a heartbeat. And also, could I always say, put a shout out to other business owners and other people are doing the same that I, same thing I am, if they need some, um, some moral support. And like, I'm lucky I have quite a good network in Leeds of um, other PR people, other kind of media people that we meet quite regularly for kind of moral support. But if you are going through that and you want to chat to someone about, you know, the DAOs, life of an entrepreneur and life running a business then please kind of tap me up again for coffee and cake um because sometimes it can be quite a lonely place so i'm always open for you know other people in these they want to connect then mm-hmm. i'm always a friendly ear mm-hmm. but apart from that no and what i say sure i don't know find me on linkedin vicky rogerson vicky v-o-c-k-i-e rogerson probably arguing about something about food, which you know, always connects me on on there um and i'll say she'll say a northpr.co.uk see all of our work and who we work with and what we do and kind of our team my team who are amazing and much better at pr than i am mm. um and then yeah well, i don't know what our instagram is north pr uk i think well i'll put all the links in the show notes anyway so if people want them they can find them you can just like be lazy and click through there because searching on google is really hard isn't it uh... <laughs> yeah <laughs> uh... yeah so yeah I, that that's that's all my questions that's everything um so yeah thank you very much for doing this this morning i, I was going to start talking about weather more in the recordings i was going to make that a more more thing because i've done various recordings at different points and it's always like when i'm talking about climate change especially if it's like it's snowing in the middle of summer or whatever or it's, it's 39 degrees or whatever you're kind of like yeah this is weird isn't it um but yeah it's kind of nondescript today um i always do um and it's that very british thing that people don't understand unless you're from britain so when we do when i pitch in to journalists with an you know a story i always talk about the weather in the first line without fail so it's like oh it's a bit rainy today i hope it's okay in london or you know oh it's it's, it was sunny yesterday did you you know like Mm. and i kind of do it without really thinking about it Mm. it's just that's you just talk about you just talk about the weather but people who are not from britain find that really odd yeah, like why are you talking about the weather? Like, what's the point? But that is that is a national pastime, isn't it? To understand, you know, is it is it raining where you are? You know, like it's raining here. Yeah, where are you? you no. Know? Well, and we can have you know three seasons, four seasons in one day. So it's like, oh, yeah. it's snowing. Now it's sunny. Oh, it's raining. Oh, yeah. I took my big a big coat out today, and you know, I didn't need it. I had to carry it around all day. <laughs> so I, I worked for this company when I was living in Amsterdam. It was like uh, doing sales around Europe. So you're ringing all these various companies and um, it's a real mixed, mixed crew, but we're mostly 
working in English, but you know, various other languages going on as well. Um, and like we, you know, you tell people if you ring in England, talk about the weather. Uh, like uh, England are famously like uh, we have the worst, get you know, the most gatekeepy. Like you can't get past English secretaries. <laughs> And like they were famous, it's like oh, I hate ringing in England. You can't get past them. And then, uh, yeah, the other thing is like talk about the weather. That'll that'll soften them up. Yeah, it will. Yeah, yeah, yeah. that I'm is a great you. tip. <laughs> that is the best tip. <laughs> <laughs> it works every time. Yeah, it softens everyone up. We talk about the weather. With well, salespeople, do it all the time. Uh, like you, you ask how how are you today? You know, get them talking about something if they're feeling like whatever. Anything to start building that rapport straight away. And then the weather's another great one. Yeah. 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 Top tip. All right. Well, um, on that note, I will say have a nice day and uh, stop us here. Great. Thank you so much. Thank you again to Vicky for being my guest. Thanks, as always, to all my guests. And thanks to you, Leeds, for being my subject. If you'd like to know more about Vicky Rogerson and or North PR, go to northpr.co.uk. If you, listening to this, are working or living in an LS postcode, or if you are from Leeds and you're working elsewhere, however you are Leeds, I'd love you to be one of the thousand loiners who help me make working hours. So please be my guest on this podcast. It's free and you get to prove what you said before I publish it. Also, 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 from now on, guests can, should they wish to, pick their episode titles, write their own show notes, intros and outros, create their own episode art, edit their own interviews or episodes. So my offer to you now is you talk to me for a couple of hours and answer my questions and you will get to have some fun. A copy of what you said and the chance to remove anything you don't want publishing, free content marketing and free media practice, as much creative input into your episode as you want, to take part in a historic project set during a pivotal moment for our species and a podcast episode with your name on it and your expertise in it. You can email Working Hours at workinghourspod at western-studios.com. If you'd like to make a podcast, don't forget you can do that here and support Working Hours by buying podcast services from me, Western Studios Leeds Limited. Email makemypodcast at western-studios.com. Okay, that is me. Work for peace and plan with kindness. Cheers, ears. Take care out there and do be kind to each other, Leeds. Working Hours is produced, recorded, edited and published by Simon Treen for Western Studios, Leeds Limited. The music was The Bees from Chopin's Etudes, which is in the public domain and was taken from museopen.org. Go to western-studios.com and use the contact page on the site to drop me a message about either working hours or about your own Leeds podcast project. Keep up to date with working hours and find out about the other great Leeds podcasts that Western Studios is involved with by following Western Studios Leeds on Facebook at facebook.com forward slash western underscore studios underscore Leeds and on LinkedIn, linkedin linkedin.com forward slash company forward slash western hyphen studios western studios leads is available to loiners to help them realize their own podcast projects for only 30 pounds for an hour of audio podcast work or 40 pounds for an hour of video podcast work email make my podcast at western hyphen studios.com with details of your project and what support you want to get your leads podcast made whatever your podcast question or need Get in touch with Western Studios Leads.